I think the world is always damaged. You don't have to be an Augustinian Christian to believe that um, the human condition is likely to be far full of uh, pain and to have far more pain than satisfaction or pleasure or or uh, self-realization. Um, so the world is always damaged. Does that mean that it is it is equally damaged um, f uh, all through time? And I don't know how how w one would would answer that. Um, one's own unhappiness goes up and down. One's moment good moments come and vanish. Um, I'd rather not think of the world that way because there are too many of us alive at any given moment even if there aren't many people in the world and each one is a world and each one is having ups and downs and ins and outs, uh, bad moments and good moments, many more bad moments than good moments I dare say. Um, so uh, uh, is the world damaged? Yes. Is the world damaged? No. You can't generalize about the world. Is it more damaged if you can generalize about it? Is it more damaged now than it ever was? Well, there are many, 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 many more people alive. Many, many, many more sources of pain and suffering. Many different kinds of suffering. Many more ingenious ways of making people suffer as well as giving them pleasure. I don't know. Uh, is the world more damaged? It is full of horrors, some in the 20th century, perhaps worse than any before then. Um, but the world has always had horrors. Um, no, the point is to live one's life. Um, whether or not you think the world is damaged, to, to, uh, to live a life. but. Never, never to think that you can lead a good life. Never, never to think that you can lead the good life. I don't think there is any. And I've never seen a description of a good life that has filled me with anything but distaste, as in Aristotle's in envisaging the good life. It's built on slavery and organized for war. What kind of life of virtue is that? Is that, or in Plato's Republic, what what kind of good life do most lead in Plato's Republic? Or what is the good life in Marx? It's ludicrous. You you you. What do you do in the morning, and what do you do in the afternoon? And I know you criticize. You're a critic in the evening. There's nothing left to criticize. What do you do in the morning? The Marxist utopia in the afternoon. It's idiotic. The, the notion of the, you'll permit me to say, with every lack of respect to others who believe in the idea of a good life, that the idea of a, a good life is bonkers and we should grow out of it. We should, on balance, expect a life that is not too miserable. I think of two things that help to define a tolerable life that people need and are right to need and want, and they are the, the two that Freud comes up with, work and love. So if that, I mean, you could then unpack these, each of these two words. Find something you like to do and do it as well as you can until you think you can no longer do it well and then try to do something else. Always having your eye on whatever you're doing as long as it, is, as it is not indecent or cruel or exploitative, do it. On the other hand, uh, care for people uh, other than yourself, whether it be in the form of romantic love or domestic love, or what for Emerson and Thoreau, I think, was the highest of all kinds of love, love of friends. work and love, filled out variously by this thinker and that thinker. 
Can you have work and love in a damaged world? Yes, you can, but not with an easy conscience. Why not an easy conscience? Because it's never justified. There's always too much damage in the world for you to, for you to think that the world exists for your work and your love. We are all up to a certain point in varying degrees of intensity, like characters in a Jane Austen novel. We are oblivious and can't help but be, to some extent, oblivious. We would die from the impact of true knowledge of the amount of suffering existing just around us at any given moment in time. This is, this is a lesson taught powerfully by George Eliot in Middle March. We die um, if we could hear the heartbeat of a squirrel. We would die from the roar on the other end of, at the other end of silence. So how does one live against a backdrop of nothingness? What does one do about the pathologies that seem to make life less worth living rather than more worth living. Once you're determined to do something, the obligation is to do your best. Should you assume an obligation to do something? I think one should. It's not the same thing for everybody, though. But, but to sort of struggle against pathology on the one hand and the temptation of Merceau, of nihilism, destructive nihilism on the other hand, it's enough to keep you going, fill up a life. <laughs>